morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you're joining us from to, for today's event. I want to thank all of you for taking the time for joining us for this important discussion. Um, and a special word of thanks to His Excellency Minister Hanif Atmar for taking time out of his very busy schedule uh, to join us for this uh, important and uh, timely discussion. Um, I want to invite all of you to also take part in the discussion uh, after Minister Atmar's opening remarks. I'll then ask a, a two or three questions, but then we'll open it up for audience questions. And you can submit your questions in the chat box, which is immediately below the video screen that you're watching today's program on. Um, we'd also invite you to join us via Twitter um, with the hashtag Afghan Peace. That's hashtag Afghan Peace. Um, and if you're submitting questions, uh, please do give your name and where you're joining us from today um, in terms of asking the question. Um, USIP has been working in Afghanistan since 2002 to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict. Um, but for USIP, trying to provide support, a sustainable peace process uh, in Afghanistan is our highest priority program. Certainly for us in the Asia program, this is where we're devoting uh, a lot of our resources. Um, we work with partners at the local level in Afghanistan, at the national level in Afghanistan, at the regional level, as well as the international uh, level to try to support a peace process that listens to and is responsive to the needs of all Afghans who are desperate to end four decades of conflict. Today's discussion really couldn't have come at a more critical time. Um, I have to say we did try to time it to start you know, with the start of intra-Afghan negotiations. Uh, but that proved to be a bit of a moving target that was too difficult to pin down. So we thought we'd seize the moment and the opportunity to go ahead and have the discussion today. Um, uh, we did think that momentum was building for the start of direct talks, first after the U.S.-Taliban agreement on February 29th, when talks were scheduled to start on March 10th uh, and then got delayed. Um, we then thought after the July Eid ceasefire, we might see the talks give them, uh, you know, more, there's more momentum for the start of talks. And that was followed, of course, by the consultative lawyer Jirga earlier this month uh, that approved the release of 400 Taliban prisoners to, you know, to facilitate the start of talks. Um, however, new obstacles to talks have appeared and it's now not exactly clear when the intra-Afghan negotiations will begin. Um, I did see one news report uh, just in the last couple hours that Chairman Abdullah did mention uh, that he thinks the negotiations will begin next week, although with the important caveat, uh, with relative confidence. Um, uh, so we'll see. But meanwhile, uh, Taliban attacks continue unabated, violence levels are far too high, and innocent civilians uh, desperate for peace are continuing to suffer. In addition to the importance of the intra-Afghan talks uh, and the negotiations, you know, building and strengthening regional and international support for peace in Afghanistan is critically important if peace is to be achieved and sustained. Afghanistan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of course, plays a key role in building support for the peace process uh, between Afghanistan's diverse neighbors in the region and other major regional and international actors. While USIP has had the honor of hosting Minister Atmar on many occasions before at USIP, um, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome him back virtually, unfortunately, um, uh, for the first time in his capacity as the Acting Minister of Foreign Affairs. Um, again, I wish we could be doing this in our lovely building in Washington, uh, but the advantage of doing this virtually is I think we get a much broader and wider audience than if we were hosting it in our own office. Um, uh, prior to this position, Minister Atmar served as National Security Advisor from 2014 to 2018, as Minister of Interior from 2008 to 2010, as Minister of Education from 2006 to 2008, uh, and as Minister of Rural Rehabilitation and Development from 2002 to 2006. So he certainly has a wide perspective and familiarity of a lot of the key issues uh, relevant to building peace in Afghanistan. Um, during the 1990s, when I first met um, Minister, then Mr. Atmar, um, uh, he was a highly respected aid worker 
uh, holding senior positions in international aid organizations and providing humanitarian and development assistance in Afghanistan. Uh, and with that, I'd like to again uh, and, uh, welcome uh, Minister Yatmar uh, and to provide your keynote remarks. And thanks again for taking the time join, to join, join us today. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wilder. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. First, let me thank you so much for organizing this event. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I thank your participants uh, today uh, for their interest in Afghanistan and uh, in the future of um, our peace efforts. Um, uh, we are uh, so appreciative of uh, the work of USAIP, a very well respected organization in Afghanistan. Uh, and we are uh, fully committed uh, to our public engagement, uh, public uh, uh, access to information and holding public debates. Uh, we are particularly uh, giving uh, importance to this kind of engagement with our US uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, we consider the United States government and people as uh, very well appreciated uh, stakeholders, uh, both in terms of their investment uh, in Afghanistan, uh, but also uh, their interest in the outcome of, of the peace process. Uh, let me take this opportunity to offer my appreciation uh, 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 for the sacrifices of uh, the brave uh, U.S. Uh, men and women in uniform and those of our other international partners as well as uh, Afghan brave uh, soldiers who made the ultimate sacrifice uh, for our shared security and, and defense. Uh, it's also important that we uh, uh, make an acknowledgement of the generosity of the U.S. taxpayers uh, who contributed so generously uh, for the rebuilding of Afghanistan to be a better place for its uh, citizens. Uh, uh, it's uh, also uh, 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 my uh, duty to uh, speak on behalf of the Afghan government and people uh, and express our heartfelt thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, we are praying uh, also for all of those who have been affected by the pandemic of COVID-19 and also recent floods uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, and this is an important uh, occasion on which to uh, once again renew the call for a humanitarian ceasefire so that uh, we, the government of Afghanistan, together with our international partners, uh, reach out to um, Afghans throughout the country with our life-saving and life-sustaining services. Uh, Dr. Wilder, as you suggested, uh, I, I thought of uh, at least three topics to offer uh, some quick uh, perspectives uh, um, uh, to kickstart the discussion today. Uh, the, the, the first issue I wanted to uh, talk about is a quick update on, on the peace uh, process and the progress we've made uh, so far. Uh, you shared the good news and, and our optimism uh, that we, we are much closer to the start of a peace negotiation than we have ever been before. Uh, we are um, uh, optimistic that next week we will be making uh, a big uh, um, uh, progress in this respect. Uh, the last hurdles in terms of release of prisoners uh, and a couple of difficult questions that we had uh, are being uh, addressed uh, uh, successfully. So hopefully, uh, we will be soon done with all those initial hurdles that were uh, in the way of starting uh, the peace negotiation. 
Uh, this is important to say that the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan is fully committed to peace uh, and uh, a political settlement. Uh, uh, and, and because of that deep commitment, uh, we have already delivered on uh, most of uh, the uh, uh, obligations and promises we've made uh, to uh, um, start the peace uh, negotiation. Uh, you may already know that over 5,000 of Taliban's prisoners have been already released and some more will be released in the coming days. So hopefully this will remove the last uh, obstacle that the Taliban uh, have uh, had uh, for the start of the negotiation. Uh, our inclusive uh, negotiating team is ready, uh, uh, fully representing all social and political groups in Afghanistan. Uh, to engage the Taliban uh, negotiating team uh, as soon as they are ready. Uh, let me take this opportunity to thank our international partners who have made this progress uh, possible. First of all is our U.S. colleagues. We are uh, uh, appreciative of the U.S. peace efforts. Uh, there are other five countries who have helped greatly in, in the process, Qatar, Uzbekistan, Norway, Indonesia, uh, and Germany. Uh, also, let me take this opportunity to thank our neighbors and extended neighbors, including Pakistan, Iran, uh, China, India, Russia, Turkey, UAE, and Saudi Arabia for their continued help in, in the process. There are already 12 countries that have offered to host uh, the negotiation, peace negotiation, which is a good example of uh, uh, regional consensus and international cooperation and interest in, in support of the Afghan uh, peace process. However, there are challenges, and this brings me to my second issue, uh, uh, the challenges that are uh, uh, very Im uh, much important for, for the first phase of, of, of the peace process, some of which were uh, already discussed by uh, the Afghan uh, peace consultative lawyer Jirga that you referred to, Dr. Wilder. Uh, the Jirga, uh, in fact, uh, reviewed the entire peace process and also the questions, policy questions that the Afghan uh, government uh, put to the Jirga. Uh, uh, of course, one of the key questions was, uh, uh, um, uh, how can we overcome the hurdles, i.e. the release of the 400 uh, Taliban uh, prisoners that were considered to be a high value prisoners uh, out of the 5,000? Um, and, and then um, uh, to also spell out the demands of the Afghan people for the rest of, of, of the peace process. Uh, the lawyer Jirga came up with some specific uh, uh, recommendations uh, to the government of Afghanistan um, uh, on, on the release of the prisoners and proceeding with uh, the uh, uh, peace process. Uh, the, the first conditionality that they openly talked about was, uh, was uh, uh, for the president's uh, release not to go back to the battlefield. Uh, second, uh, they demanded strongly the release of the Afghan government prisoners uh, by the Taliban. They asked for immediate start of the um, uh, peace negotiation between the government and the Taliban. Uh, and they asked for reduction of, of violence um, and uh, a humanitarian ceasefire. Uh, so those are the key uh, uh, demands as spelled out by our uh, consultative peace jirga that we have to pursue uh, well, for the uh, start of the um, uh, peace negotiation. Uh, um, uh, and uh, pursue it through through the process uh, as well. 
Uh, this calls for further collaboration between the Afghan government and its international partners. Uh, now, the uh, final issue I wanted to quickly talk about is uh, it's not just the process and, and the key prerequisites for the process, it's also the outcome and the end state of the peace process that our people are extremely interested in. Uh, so uh, the end state of the peace process was also talked about during our peace consultative jerga and already national consensus is built uh, for, for the end state. Uh, this end state is not just an ideological position of the people of Afghanistan, uh, it's a necessary condition for any lasting peace in Afghanistan and it's uh, a necessary condition to make sure that Afghanistan never becomes uh, a safe haven for international terrorism uh, and that our region is secure and stable. Um, so what are the key elements of, of, of this end state that we will have to pursue through the negotiation? It's uh, uh, a peace process aim to achieve a goal. Uh, the goal is defined by the Afghan people uh, and it has the support of the region and our international partners. Uh, so it's basically achieving peace within the Islamic Republic uh, of Afghanistan. There are three important features of uh, that Islamic Republic of Afghanistan that we need to be aware of. First, as a state, it will have to remain an independent, sovereign, unified state with its full territorial uh, integrity. Second, uh, in terms of its governance, it will have to be a, a, a constitutional representative democracy on the strong foundation of human rights, women's rights, and the rights of our minorities and all of our citizenry, if you like. Now, this is important. Our people always talk about not only preserving, uh, but also advancing the achievements in human rights, uh, democracy, uh, and women's rights uh, of the past uh, 19 years. Uh, now, uh, this is uh, the reason which provides legitimacy uh, for the pursuit of, of, of peace and the peace efforts of, of the government of Afghanistan. Now, a third feature of, of the Islamic Republic that we need to preserve uh, as the end state of the peace uh, process is its foreign relations. Uh, in terms of first security, Afghanistan should never become a safe haven of international terrorism or the region between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, uh, yes, we understand that the Taliban uh, uh, demand for the departure of foreign troops uh, from Afghanistan, but we stress on a, a, a drawdown, conditions-based drawdown of troops. Well, we certainly demand uh, the elimination and departure of all foreign fighters, terrorist fighters in our country. That's why it's important that uh, um, uh, ties to Al-Qaeda and other foreign uh, fighters will have to be severed. Uh, it is also about the future of security cooperation. Uh, Afghanistan will continue to honor its uh, 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 security agreements with the United States and NATO and on the other hand, Afghanistan will continue to cooperate with uh, countries of the region, especially those of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, because uh, we have common threats uh, and therefore we need to have a common responsibility, a shared responsibility to defend our nations. Politically, Afghanistan wish to pursue a multi-alignment uh, policy because we want Afghanistan uh, to be a uh, 
place for cooperation of the region and the international community, not a place for confrontation. Uh, economically, Afghanistan wishes again uh, to uh, uh, rebuild its historical place in the region as uh, a hub for trade, transit, investment, and, and commerce. Uh, with that kind of vision, we strongly believe that uh, the end state uh, will be in the best interest of not just the Afghan people, but also the United States, our NATO partners, uh, as well as the region and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. With this, Dr. Wilder, I'll, I'll uh, stop here uh, and see if, if friends have uh, questions and, and comments for me. Uh, thank you much, very much for those very substantive opening remarks. Uh, if I could just jump in with a few initial questions. Um, I was also glad to hear your optimism about the possibility of starting next week. Um, uh, but you then also mentioned some of the conditions set by the Loya Jirga, uh, some of which don't sound to me like necessarily they could be reached by next week. Um, so I guess I'm wondering what do you see as potential obstacles that could further delay the process, or are you pretty confident that the conditions of the Loya Jirga and others will be met so that the talks can indeed start next week? Um, we are pretty much optimistic because uh, um, so far uh, the key obstacle as cited by the Taliban was the release of their prisoners. And of course, we also demanded the release of our prisoners. Um, it seems that uh, most of the hurdles have been uh, uh, either removed or uh, we are in the process of building consensus on a solution. So um, I am cautiously optimistic uh, uh, that this will not be a, a further hurdle on, on the way. Uh, of course, there are those conditions set by the Loya Jerga. Uh, we do understand that not all of them will be met by the start of the uh, peace negotiation, but we are determined that they will have to be met through the process. Um, uh, but I mean, one basic thing is that uh, with the release of the last batch of the Taliban prisoners, we will have released by the end of next week uh, over 5,600 of uh, Taliban's prisoners. Uh, the Taliban will have to honor their promise that these people will not go back to the battlefield. Uh, it's a big group of people uh, and very dangerous people. Uh, so uh, we hope that our negotiation will help. Uh, second, we want a reduction in violence uh, and, and uh, the immediate humanitarian ceasefire to be established so that we can uh, reach our people with essential health and food security services. This is also in the interest of the Taliban. Um, uh, now, those things are to be negotiated, uh, hopefully uh, uh, agreed uh, early on uh, as the process starts. Uh, thanks. Um, in addition to Chairman Abdullah's comments about talks uh, perhaps starting next week, I also saw one report this morning um, that the head of the Taliban negotiating team, Ashur Bastanigzai, had said that the intra-Afghan talks will be held in different countries. Um, that I know that idea is circulating for a while, although I've not seen it formally announced by the, the head of the Taliban negotiating team. Uh, but I was wondering, what is the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan's uh, view on sort of rotating talks? Well, the first good news is that uh, uh, the Taliban and us have uh, uh, consensus on this issue. Um, so it's a good sign. Uh, yes, we want uh, the um, uh, uh, negotiations to be uh, hosted uh, in, uh, um, in, in countries that have had uh, uh, significant support for the peace process. Uh, 
Um, now, this will also be important for further building uh, regional consensus and support uh, base uh, for the peace process. So it's important. Um, um, as I said, Dr. Wilder, that uh, uh, the United States and our regional partners are legitimate stakeholders in the process. Every one of them is concerned not only about the process, but also about the outcome, the end state of the process because it will have a direct impact on their security, on, on, on regional stability. So they need to be part of the process. Now, hosting the talks will also be one way of ensuring uh, regional inclusion in the process. But what is important that this will be among Afghans, between the government of Afghanistan and, and the Taliban and our foreign friends and partners uh, will be supporting uh, the process. Thanks. You did mention the regional neighbors. I just wanted to come back to that. You know, as the Minister of Foreign Affairs, you know, how do you set, assess the regional support for the peace process? Um, and what do you think is the most useful thing your neighbors could do to support peace in Afghanistan? Um, the good news is that um, we have consensus on a number of issues in the region. Uh, first, consensus on peace. Everybody in the region is supportive of the peace process. Second, consensus on reduction in violence and on humanitarian ceasefire and on comprehensive ceasefire. We do have that consensus in the region. Now, recently, we have uh, increasingly seen uh, support from the region and our international partners for the end state that I just uh, uh, described uh, briefly a little while ago. Uh, now, this is uh, critically important for us uh, so that the region is supportive of the outcome uh, that is uh, consistent with the well and aspirations of the Afghan people. Uh, this is good news. However, there is still a risk that uh, some regional actors, well, uh, uh, it will be difficult uh, to uh, speak with any level of certainty, uh, but at least certain circles uh, would want to pursue not an end state that the Afghan people uh, demand or the majority of our international partners, perhaps they might uh, try to define the end state in terms of their narrow political national security interests. That will be se a, a serious danger uh, to the peace process in Afghanistan. So what we are asking our neighbors and, and regional partners is, number one, support the immediate start of the uh, negotiation, peace negotiation. Uh, number two, express your support for the end state. Uh, and number three, support the humanitarian ceasefire and, and the comprehensive ceasefire as a result of uh, peace negotiation. Uh, we are also asking our international partners to stick to those uh, uh, principal issues uh, here. What would be most dangerous for Afghanistan and the, the process, and to be quite frank with you, to everybody in the region, uh, by extension, uh, is that we lose the regional and international consensus for peace in Afghanistan. Thanks. Uh, sticking to that team, I'm going to open it up for a couple of some of the audience questions. Um, I have a question here from uh, Andren Raj of the Nordic Counterterrorism Network, who asks, recently, Pakistani military and diplomatic leaders met with Taliban negotiators, including Mullah Brother, and announced they were supporting peace efforts. Uh, how does the Afghan government view this meeting? And what do you understand as Pakistan's message to the top overall Taliban leaders? Um, we certainly support any effort by any country uh, in uh, um, support of the, the peace process. Pakistan 
has a key role because of its uh, significant influence with the Taliban. And we uh, uh, hope that they will continue to use that influence uh, in uh, support of the peace process. Uh, we welcome uh, their um, uh, uh, political support for the peace process, but also uh, th their recent uh, um, uh, 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 support and endorsement of the UN Security Council resolution, uh, especially when it comes to violence or those networks that continue to engage in terrorism against Afghans and, and our international partners. Uh, this is very well appreciated. Uh, however, I would have recommended a slightly different approach uh, to uh, such engagement to my Pakistani friends. Uh, I will certainly do that in, uh, uh, in my con next conversation with them, uh, that uh, it's important that the legitimate government of Afghanistan is part of the entire process because uh, everybody in the region and the international community uh, have said um, and, and expressed their support for an Afghan-owned and Afghan-led peace process. Uh, and the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan is representing uh, the Afghan people and need to be uh, uh, closely uh, engaged in the process and consulted. Thanks. Um, not surprisingly, we have lots of media interest in today's event, and I want to turn to a few questions from journalists, uh, starting with a question from Reuters correspondent Charlotte Greenfield, who asks, uh, China has sent signals that it is interested in becoming more involved in Afghanistan, potentially with infrastructure investment. Have you or your office had much contact with China in recent weeks on whether China can play a role in Afghanistan's economic and infrastructure development? Well, we are working very closely with China. Uh, uh, again, as I said, Afghanistan works with uh, our international partners, US, NATO, Europe, uh, Japan, Australia, also our regional partners such as China, Russia, India, uh, and our neighbors. Uh, again, the reason for this is the, the nature of the threat. We are together facing a common threat. So therefore we have a common interest. Uh, uh, we are uniquely placed to see the commonality of that interest. There may be many, many, and indeed there are many differences uh, among these uh, actors elsewhere in the region and in globally. But where we see them uh, most in common is in Afghanistan and in the region. And especially when it comes to the issue of counterterrorism, uh, peace and reconciliation and long-term stability in the region. Now, China is directly affected by terrorism in the region. And China has a legitimate interest in stability in the region, as well as cooperation uh, with uh, both Afghanistan and our regional partners. So there are three things that we are uh, discussing uh, uh, systematically with our Chinese uh, friends. Uh, number one is um, uh, the Afghan-led, Afghan-owned uh, peace process. Uh, which is uh, uh, um, uh, important uh, and China understands that the Afghan peace process uh, is in fact a strategic investment in uh, countering international terrorism in the region. Um, the second uh, point is um, uh, the uh, uh, regional and international cooperation uh, around and on Afghanistan so that Afghanistan does not become uh, uh, a place for confrontation and uh, regional uh, rivalries. Uh, and finally, it's the economic issue, as you mentioned. Uh, um, uh, the way we would like to define the role we can play is uh, for Afghanistan 
uh, to once again become the hub for trade, transit, investment, and commerce, uh, just like we've been uh, that hub for uh, our shared civilization for centuries. Um, now, uh, this is important to see uh, that Afghanistan is a land bridge between South Asia and Central Asia, China and uh, um, uh, the uh, um, uh, Middle East. Uh, and Afghanistan can potentially play uh, an extremely important role in regional connectivity. So all of those issues are very much relevant to our current discussion uh, with our Western partners, as well as uh, China and our other regional uh, partners. Thanks. If I could just stick to the economic theme and jump in with the question, you know, that there is the upcoming donor conference in November scheduled. Um, what will be the government of Afghanistan's key messages to Afghanistan's major donors in terms of uh, continuing uh, support to Afghanistan? Uh, well, um, the, the first message that we will have will be to thank them. Thank them for their generosity, for their um, uh, uh, investment and, and support. Um, they do understand that succeeding in uh, peace and uh, stabilization of Afghanistan and the region is in the best interest of uh, the region and the global community. Uh, so um, uh, it's important to uh, look at uh, uh, investment in Afghanistan from a perspective of shared interest in security, stability, and economic uh, recovery uh, of the region. Uh, now, from that perspective, uh, of course, Afghanistan will continue to seek uh, a, um, a development assistance, uh, as well as other types of economic cooperations um, uh, it's not just the aid that we will be seeking, it's also market access, uh, it's uh, a technical assistance, uh, it's also investment and guarantees for, for legitimate foreign investment uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, because the goal for us is not to live on aid of uh, 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 other nations uh, uh, for uh, for many millennia, we've been uh, a self-reliant nation uh, and we are absolutely confident that we will achieve self-reliance uh, um, uh, pretty soon. Uh, however, given the nature of uh, the uh, uh, fight against international terrorism, uh, Afghanistan simply does not have the resources uh, or, uh, which are required for this kind of counterterrorism. Um, uh, Dr. Wilder, you and I have always been uh, in discussion around these issues that Afghanistan is not only fighting on its behalf, but it's fighting on behalf of the region and the global community. So, uh, uh, and, and this uh, endeavor requires the kind of uh, uh, resources that are beyond the means of Afghanistan. Uh, but hopefully, if international investments now at this stage uh, uh, helps us with advancing the peace process and then the implementation of the peace agreement, uh, there will be a significant reduction in security costs uh, and there will be a significant increase in opportunities for uh, economic investments. This is the theme that we will take to the November conference, but we will be also assuring our donors uh, that Afghanistan is fully aware and committed to the mutual, uh, mutual accountability benchmarks between Afghanistan and the international community. Thanks. And just a message to viewers, we have about 20 minutes left. Uh, if you want to submit a question, please do so through the chat box feature that's immediately below the video screen or video player that you're watching uh, today's program from. Uh, and please do identify yourself, your name, and where you're uh, uh, asking your question from. Um, again, another question from a journalist, uh, Nick Schifrin from PBS NewsHour asks, 
What is the solution that's been found to Australian, Germany, and or French concerns about prisoner releases? And will Dr. Abdullah be leading the talks? Um, some of our international partners ha do have concerns about the release of uh, certain individuals. Um, uh, uh, but they also understand the significance uh, of uh, the peace process uh, and the cost of the peace process. Uh, uh, the cost of peace is not just on Afghans' uh, shoulders, it's, it's also a kind of cost that we need to talk about it internationally. Uh, now, uh, without going into details of things that are being discussed and negotiated at the moment, uh, Afghanistan will always be uh, mindful of our international partners' uh, interests um, and uh, fully committed uh, to, to our national interests and, and uh, those of our uh, partners. Uh, now, within that framework, we will work with everyone to reach consensus uh, so that at the end of the day, everybody is uh, comfortable and, and satisfied with the solution uh, that comes out of uh, this um, uh, arduous and difficult uh, process. Uh, second, uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah is um, the chairman of uh, the High Council for National Reconciliation. Uh, and we have a second body that reports to the High Council is um, uh, the um, uh, uh, national negotiating team led by Minister Stanikzai. Uh, so uh, the negotiation will be directly led uh, uh, by Minister Stanikzai and his negotiating team uh, reporting to the High Council uh, and uh, to the President of Afghanistan. Uh, thanks. And then question from Jennifer Hansler of CNN, who asks, are you concerned about a drawdown of U.S. troops ahead of the U.S. presidential election and the impact that could have on your leverage in the negotiations? Um, we have been assured that uh, uh, the agreement between the Taliban and the United States is uh, about a conditions-based drawdown of troops. Uh, the conditions that matter to the United States uh, and its security, uh, as well as to Afghanistan and the region. Uh, we are confident that uh, those conditions will be informing decisions made by our partners. And mind you also uh, the fact that there is uh, a bilateral security agreement between the United States and Afghanistan and a security agreement between Afghanistan and NATO. Uh, and uh, they have expressed uh, their intentions and assured the government and people of Afghanistan uh, that we are in this together uh, and we are working together to achieve uh, the end state uh, for which the United States uh, has expressed its full support. So now, drawdown of troops and the types of uh, methods of cooperation uh, will be, uh, of course, informed by uh, the, the common goal that we are pursuing to achieve. Thanks. And then there's a related uh, question from a, um, uh, one of the audience members saying, given the bipartisan appetite for withdrawal demonstrated by Washington, what do you see as the role of the U.S. moving forward? Um, uh, first of all, um, if you look at the um, uh, bilateral security agreement between Afghanistan and the United States, which was signed in 2014, 
already then we talked about the withdrawal of troops uh, and uh, the self-reliance of Afghanistan, both, both in terms of security and uh, um, our economic situation. So Afghanistan has never had a kind of vision uh, to have uh, presence of foreign troops here permanently. That has never been the issue. However, partnership and cooperation has always been a permanent feature of our policy. Uh, to Sorry, Mr. Akmar, we lost you for about uh, one minute in there. If you could just uh, go back about 30 seconds, 45 seconds of what you were saying. You froze for a moment. Okay. Um, as I said, that even early on in 2014, when we signed the bilateral security agreement with the United States and uh, the SOFA agreement with uh, NATO, uh, we had the vision of self-reliance of Afghanistan in terms of uh, security uh, and our economic uh, situation. So we even then predicted uh, the uh, drawdown and full withdrawal of uh, foreign troops from Afghanistan as the capacity of the Afghan National Security Forces is built. Uh, and, and they take more and more of the responsibility as they do now. So uh, uh, it, it has always been part of the end state that Afghanistan as an independent country will be responsible for its uh, uh, own security. However, when it comes to the global and international nature of terrorism and the threats that we face, uh, the cooperation with the United States, our NATO partners and, and regional partners uh, has been a key feature of our foreign policy, uh, both security cooperation as well as uh, development and, and economic cooperation. So our vision is uh, to work together through this peace process and achieve an end state in which Afghanistan will not need the presence of foreign troops, but Afghanistan will remain a key partner uh, for security uh, and economic growth of the region uh, and by extension, the international community. Thank you. I'm going to take you back to the regional issues and one of the more complicated ones, of course, is the India-Pakistan conflict. And one of our viewers has asked, um, um, is, is peace Afghanistan possible without some form of agreement between Pakistan and India not to spread their rivalry uh, in, in, to other regional proxy conflicts? Um, yes, it is. It is possible because both India and Pakistan are threatened by uh, regional and international terrorist networks. Uh, well, India has been a victim for a very long time, just like Afghanistan. Uh, but we must also uh, look at uh, the cost of uh, terrorism in Pakistan and, and the fact that terrorism has been a threat uh, to the people and the state of Pakistan. Uh, and if you look at the over 20 of uh, uh, regional and international terrorist networks, there are many that are enemies of India and there are some that threaten Pakistan as well. Uh, uh, but of course, the, the sad story is that all of them threaten Afghanistan. <laughs> uh, um, uh, now, we uh, as a friend of India, but also neighbor of Pakistan, uh, we are certainly explaining to them uh, that cooperation uh, is the key uh, to win this battle. Uh, uh, bringing uh, their other rivalries uh, to Afghanistan, whether it's India or Pakistan or other uh, regional and global actors uh, that have certain types of rivalries uh, among them, uh, will not benefit anybody. At the end of the day, 
uh, uh, the war is certainly spreading and having uh, spillover effects and affecting everybody. I mean, uh, uh, remember 9-11 was planned from this region uh, and carried out by terrorists uh, uh, that they uh, act globally. So it's important for all regional and global actors to understand that there's one, only one way uh, to defeat terrorism, and that is regional and global cooperation. Yeah, I want to stick in the region and ask uh, a couple of questions that have come in about Central Asia. And so one viewer has asked that you're expected, I think, for, to go on a trip to Uzbekistan uh, soon. Um, uh, and what do you hope to get out of that? And then along the same lines, um, Meg from Virginia adds, how can your northern neighbors in Central Asia, especially Uzbekistan, given its interest in facilitating peace talks, contribute to peace more generally? I lost you, Dr. Wilder, on the second question. What, what, expect, uh, what do we expect from Uzbekistan? Yeah, how can your northern neighbors, uh, especially Uzbekistan, given its interest in facilitating peace talks, contribute to the peace process more generally? Okay. Um, the five Central Asian countries uh, are extremely important for Afghanistan, and we are important to them as well. Um, uh, historically, we share a civilization. We, we've lived with each other, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have depended on e each other. Um, this is uh, certainly uh, what we have inherited from our shared history and our future is of course interdependent. So we have very high stakes in terms of security uh, and economic prosperity as well as our uh, uh, social and cultural uh, uh, ties, uh, but specifically with Uzbekistan and, and Central Asia, uh, we uh, uh, have a vision uh, of uh, peace, security, stability, as well as uh, regional economic development benefiting Afghanistan, Central Asia, South Asia, and all of our partners uh, in the region. Uzbekistan plays a critical role in this process. Uh, uh, tomorrow, that I will be hopefully traveling there, my specific goal will be, number one, to look at the road map that we have in terms of our bilateral and multilateral cooperation with Uzbekistan and Central Asia, but also to finalize some agreements on uh, import of electricity, uh, uh, regional connectivity and railway projects, uh, as well as increasing trade and transit between the two uh, countries and uh, uh, reaching out to other uh, regional partners. Uh, and all of those are good reasons for Uzbekistan and the rest of uh, Central Asia to help us uh, with uh, security. Uh, as I said, the combination of uh, uh, regional and international terrorists working closely uh, with uh, insurgency in Afghanistan uh, have posed a serious threat to all of the five uh, Central Asian countries, as well as China, Russia, India, uh, uh, Iran, and then Pakistan. So uh, it is extremely important for us to work closely with uh, Central Asia uh, and assure them that the peace in Afghanistan is going to serve their security needs as well. Thank you. I wanted to turn go back to a press question to for a question from Pam Constable from the Washington Post who asked, you said the end state of peace talks requires Afghanistan remaining a constitutional democracy. The Taliban appear to strongly oppose this idea. Is any middle ground possible? I hope so. 
Um, uh, but whatever um, uh, middle ground is there for us uh, to achieve, uh, there's one key principle that nobody can deny, and that is the will, the free will of the Afghan people. I mean, the form of the government and the polity that we are going to have now or in a post-settlement situation will have to be determined by the will of the Afghan people. Now, the question that I would have for the Taliban is, are you going to respect the will of the Afghan people or not? Um, and, and that will have to be also the key question for our regional and international partners. There will not be a, uh, an acceptable end state without respect for the will of the Afghan people. So uh, we can certainly talk about uh, um, different forms of governance, uh, but the will of the Afghan people now is uh, that they want a constitutional democracy uh, they want an inclusive political system. Uh, they want full respect for human rights, women's rights, and the rights of uh, our minorities. Uh, these are key values that any modern uh, civilization will have to rest on. And Afghanistan cannot be an exception uh, in, in terms of the view of this or that political group. Afghanistan. Uh, has already voted uh, to be uh, a, a modern civilization uh, based on, on those uh, uh, values. Thanks. We're running short of time because I know you have another commitment at the top of the hour, but I think I'll try to squeeze in one last question and maybe group a few together. We've had several uh, questions from viewers about the idea of holding another bond conference. Uh, uh, like the one after the fall of the Taliban that led to the establishment of today's Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, um, but this time including the Taliban. Uh, what would you say about a proposal along these lines? Uh, what we are hoping that we should have uh, the direct uh, peace negotiation between the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan and the Taliban started as soon as possible, hopefully next week sometime. Uh, now, uh, that negotiation should lead uh, to a uh, peace agreement, uh, to a political settlement. Uh, it will be important then to have uh, regional and international support for that agreement, especially if that agreement is uh, uh, based on the kind of end state uh, that is acceptable to Afghan people, the region and the international community. Uh, now then, uh, there is a need uh, for uh, guaranteeing that agreement regionally and internationally. Uh, and it's important uh, for uh, Afghanistan, both the Islamic Republic and the Taliban, to ensure international uh, political and economic support uh, for that uh, peace agreement. Uh, now, uh, how to generate that support uh, will be certainly uh, uh, in terms of bringing issues to the United Nations Security Council and also to regional and international conferences. Uh, those are the means. Uh, to achieve the goal, and we will be actively pursuing uh, the goal and looking at the most effective means. Thank you, and I'm going to have to apologize to all of those of you who did ask questions that we didn't have time to get to, but a very warm thanks to Minister Akbar for answering quite a wide range of questions from all of you um, and me. Uh, and again, safe travels to Uzbekistan, and we wish you all the best as you work and your government works to try to move the peace process forward and that we do make headway towards achieving peace, which Afghan, Afghans so desperately need and deserve. So thank you once again for taking the time uh, to join us today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for your wonderful work as USAIP.